Welcome back to another episode of the We Live to Build podcast. Today's episode is with Stephen Keery, an Australian entrepreneur who started, grew, and IPO'd a company on the Australian Stock Exchange, and now he's based in Louisiana buying houses and flipping them and holding on to them. The reason why all of this is relevant is because his strategy is extremely important. You've heard this before, diversify, diversify, diversify. When you're running a company, there's a chance that it might exist today, but doesn't exist tomorrow. And if you ask Warren Buffett how to make billions of dollars, he'll say to start as early as possible. So if you understand this concept of compounding your wealth over time, and you couple that with owning a company, there's a lot of ways in which you can grow your wealth and diversify during the process of running and growing a company and do it in a way that if your company should ever die, you walk away with something of value. And if your company doesn't die, you still walk away with something of value. So my conversation with Steve was really interesting because he not only talked about specific legal loopholes you can use to maximize your profit and minimize your taxes through the process of diversification from your company and purchasing property, but we also got to hear his story. So I hope you enjoy this episode, and I hope that you come away from it with a deeper sense of appreciation for your own value, for all of the hard work you're putting into starting and growing the company you have. And don't forget through it all that you need to get paid too. So without further ado, I bring you Steve Keery. Welcome to We Live to Build. My name is Sean Weisbrot, and I'm an entrepreneur, investor, and advisor based in Asia for over 12 years. Join us every week to fast track your personal growth so you can meet the ever increasing demands of the company or companies you are passionately building. Time waits for no one, so let's get started now. So before we get any further, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about what you did that put you in the position to be doing this now? Thanks for having me, Sean. Yeah, so I left university, you know, back in 2002 and, you know, sort of set out on an entrepreneurial path, did a marketing consultancy, and I sort of merged that business into a something that focused on natural health. And then I merged in with some other partners into a, a online directory at the time. So uh, we ran like the natural therapy pages and home improvement pages, which were like essentially better yellow pages at that time. You know, we're sort of talking like mid 2000s. So, so that was the extent of it. As we grew, we grew it to be, you know, an on-demand service for trades people was our biggest size, the home improvement space. It's very similar to for the American audience, very similar to Home Advisor, basically the same business model. So we're connecting consumers with contractors and we're doing it through apps and technology and, you know, making that, that as seamless as possible. So look, we, we grew that IPO on the Australian Stock Exchange in November last year and we had a market capitalization of $315 million. So that was obviously very exciting for myself. I had left operational duties about two and a bit years before that, but still maintained a stake in the company. So I enjoyed that IPO. But I went through different stages of like investing in the company and then starting to diversify from the company to diversify my portfolio. All right, great. Thanks for the intro. I loved your story because when you first approached me, you're like, hey, I buy houses in Louisiana. And I'm like, ah, you know, like I don't normally respond so much to people that are doing that. But then I got into your story and I was like, oh, actually, like this guy was in tech. He's built something and like this is how he's decided to retire and and enjoy the next phase of his life. So like, all right, fair enough. Let's see what you're about. (laughs) This has been a passion of yours for a while. And it resonated with me because a lot of people end up building their company for five, 10 years. And at the end of it, they may get nothing. 
or if they get something, they don't understand how to use it. And so I thought it was relevant for us to talk about how to determine the best course of action to build equity, but then also cash out something as you go so that you can protect yourself and the time and energy you've put into the business over that period of time. I'd love to know what gave you this idea that you should be focusing on what comes next while still focusing on the thing that gives you that money. Probably like most businesses and most journeys, I sort of like, I started to develop thoughts as I as I went. So, you know, it wasn't, I did always have this basic concept of rich people build businesses and buy property. So, so I always had this idea, I love business, I love tech, like I, I love what I built. The, in Australia, I'm from Australia originally, and we had the BRW rich list, you know, sort of like the Forbes list. And if you look at that, most people made their money through property or held their money in property. So I always had that idea of property, but I was very much into the tech world and very much into the company we're building. And I think I went through different stages. So if I were to lay it out, I think I had like the early, early stage where, you know, (laughs) I was broke as hell. You know, my wife, uh, well, my now wife, she was my girlfriend at the time, was supporting us. You know, she was making the money. You know, we had no money. So, you know, in that that building phase and and that went for a while. And then you start to get to like an early stage, you know, and we sort of paid a bit of a salary, but it's not very much. We're investing our profits back into growing the business. You know, you start to get employees that are paid much more than you at some point. And at that point, I was really focused on the value in the business. Um, We started to raise some seed rounds of money. And in those points, I wanted to hold as much equity as possible. So I often scrape together money and, you know, invested in those rounds as well, just so I could stop some of that dilution. And we had a couple rounds that had really good turns to the investors. You know, I could only really stomach that by putting in myself. I think I went to this stage where like I'm just pouring, pouring, pouring into the business. You know, we had sort of had five partners, right? And it was our business for a while. But as you start to get more investors and they're non-executive people in the business, they're not working. So, you know, if you're just putting a lot of profit back into the business, and not taking anything yourself, well, you're also an employee as well as an owner, right? So I think those points, I started to think more about, well, I need to diversify. And as we started to raise some more money, I started to look for opportunities to take secondaries. And that was always hard because I believed in the business. I, st- I still have shares. It's, it's still going to grow. And so I have a real belief. I was thinking, but I want to sell some because I need to diversify. It was a hard decision because I believe the shares would go up. How I made the decision to start selling some was, it's the old advice. I don't know who said it, but you know, you never go broke taking a profit. You can't hurt taking a bit of profit. And then I think what really made me realize was, I was like, I bet you I'm going to sell some of these shares and they're going to be worth so much more in the future. And I'm going to kick myself. But then I thought about it. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to kick myself, but also the fact they've gone up, I'm not going to care as much, right? <laughs> so, so I think that's how I made my decision. Was, yeah, I'm going to kick myself, but when I do, like I've also got all these other shares, so like I'm also going to be laughing. And I, I think I took, you know, taking a secondary, sort of like an insurance policy. Like you don't want to cash out your insurance policy. You pay it because you should have it. You don't want to use it. And for me, selling some of those shares just meant that if things went bad, at least I had some funds for myself. And then I think probably just to add on top of that, like as my salary started to go up, I started to actually get a decent salary. So, you know, like, yeah, I was a shareholder, but like I had a job and a good job. So I started to be able to like get bank financing. And for me, being into property, I'm like, well, now I can leverage and I can take some profit. I can buy properties. I can leverage those properties with bank financing and I can start to build a portfolio when I started to do that. Did your co-founders or your investors try to guilt you for wanting to cash something out earlier on? If investors are coming in and they're putting good money in, you can't be pulling out too big a chunk of your equity because they want that skin in the game. So I don't think they ever guilted us, but we needed to have a story. So we always had a story and it, we didn't do it in our first rounds. Like, you know, it wasn't our seed rounds. Like we often put in in those rounds. So we will showing our belief in the business. And when we first took it out, we just cut it off. And we told our investors, hey, it's been a while, you know, we like the founders, you know, haven't really bought a house or they haven't. So we, we sort of prefaced it just to cut off that objection. And we didn't really get the objection, but we were mindful of it. And we spoke to it before we just said, hey, we're taking money out. You did this like in the A round, you said. Australia didn't have as sophisticated, I think, investment things as, as, as the US. So like we didn't do rounds in a traditional way. We just sort of raised some money when we got it. We were probably lucky that Australia just didn't have a real angel ecosystem. You know, our first round, one of my partners knew old successful people with gray hairs who'd done their own businesses and they invested their own money in us. So Matt, you could probably break it down to a different rounds, but we didn't really do it that way. <laughs> at different points in time, we were like, hey, we're growing at this good level and we can keep growing. And this is what our growth path will look like over the next couple of years, 
But hey, if we could just hire all these people tomorrow, we'll bring all that growth forward. And when we had that, we just went out and raised some money. So I don't think we sort of took it the traditional way. So I don't really know what round we're at, to be honest. We were saying before that you couldn't take too much at a time. So how did you come to a decision about what was the right amount to take? And was it like all five of you agreed on taking the same amount at the same time? Or did one person take more because of a need? Like, let's say you were having a kid, but the co-founder didn't have any kids yet. So you needed more. So like, how did you manage that process? Yeah, it did vary. The first consideration was really what was the you know appetite for the round. So obviously, you need to be oversubscribed. Generally, when we're raising money, we never raise money just to have money. There was always a business need and we were making a case to grow the business. So so first off, you need to get that money, right? And you know, if you're lucky enough and we will happen to be in a bunch of cases, if you are oversubscribed and there's more people that want to invest, well, then you sort of want to bring those investors on. A couple of times, it was even like, hey, who wants to sell? Sometimes there's a little bit of that. So um, I think every round, it was just that consideration. Do we have the money we do? We're oversubscribed. Okay, who wants to sell more shares? You know, there's always a bit of discussion. So it wasn't always equal and there was different things going on. I think we just had that conversation. You need to agree. I would never do anything where my partners weren't happy, you know, to some level. Like you never have a discussion, you need to compromise somewhere. So, so you definitely need to have those conversations. You don't want anyone to feel like you're abandoning the business and you're definitely starting to diversify. But I was focused on the business. I have put my own money into the company. I haven't taken a salary yet, although I'm planning on taking some of the money from the A round to cover my back pay. It's been three years. By the time we get to the A round, it'll be four years where I've had no income, which I would like to get paid back for that time. Obviously, everyone would. But I was also thinking about selling some of the equity and taking cash from that, but I'm not sure there's enough money in the A round to get my back pay and that. So I probably am going to have to wait until like a B round to try and sell hopefully what amounts to a few million dollars at that point. I think that's probably consistent with most journeys. You know, I think it's, I think, I think it is hard to take out in an A round. Like, you know, you want, people want to see that skin. It's, it's, It's still too early, but I do agree that once like you have other investors coming on board, like you do need to have a salary. Because yes, you have shares, but these investors also have shares. So, you know, you're both going to go on that same journey of growing that share value, but you're also going on a, on a journey of you're working in the business, you know, probably very hard and probably very long hours, and you should start to be compensated for that. Well, so what I'm doing is we I have five investors right now, but it's not enough to get us to the A round. So I need to raise some more starting in the next few weeks. Mm-hmm. If I were to raise everything we need, we'd be at a million for the seed round. Yes. But even then, I'd rather put all of the money back into the team and give them salaries. Yes. Because again, I'm okay to wait another seven, eight, nine months to do an A round and then get the salary then. Because for me, whether I take the salary now or later doesn't mean anything to me, but it means the difference in maybe an extra fifty or $60,000 to hire other people. Uh, and I think that's right. Uh, and that's why I was talking about the stages. There is a stage when it's time to start diversifying. I think at this point, you want to put as much money into the business as possible. It's like a baby, you know, it needs the most nutrients. You need to like feed it like, and, and that's the main priority. You know, when you have a baby, you're probably not sleeping much. You're, you're making lots of sacrifices for that baby. And I think that's like, I always think of a business as a baby, you know, you, eat, you need to give it that um, nourishment and care. And as it starts to grow up, well, hey, you know, it becomes a child and becomes more self-sustainable and then becomes an adult and he can look after you. I think you're in that baby stage and that probably makes sense. But as that baby starts to grow, I think he can start to look after you more. I'm definitely looking forward to that in 2022. Yes, (laughs) for sure. I often reflect on this. I never had a full-time job. I was hell-bent on being entrepreneurial, you know, from the start. So I left university and started a business and I was very confident, but it was a naive confident. Like, trust me, like I, like, like I had no reason to be confident, but there was a belief, but I thought it would come soon. I, I never doubted that I'd be really successful, but I also like thought it would happen faster and easier. I think there's that old saying where you, so many people overestimate what they can do in the short term, but they underestimate what they can do in the long term. And I think that's really true. And I think that was my journey. I thought it'd be easier. I thought it would make lots of money sooner and we had disappointments at times when we thought we'll have buyers or investors and they're falling through and you know we, we've sort of been on that roller coaster of emotions and you know i remember my wife who was so supportive but at times she was like man like come on like you meant to be making money by now like you know and it took me longer than i thought where i sit and where i'm looking forward i like i think where i can go is like beyond where i always thought 
when I started my company three years ago, I thought we would be in a very different place than we are now. Here we are getting ready to finally launch the product in the next two months or so. And I was like, oh, I thought we would have been there two years ago. Exactly. Exactly. You need that little bit of naivety to push yourself and be confident and just keep going. Because then once you start moving, though, you're like, well, I'm like, I'm like, yeah, it took a bit longer. I thought it'd be further, but like, but I'm on the journey, you know, and, and now I'm going to keep going. It sort of comes in handy. Yeah, I remember when I talked to my parents about it in the beginning, they're like, are you sure you want to do this? And I was like, yeah, like, this is what I need to do to challenge myself. I'm, I was like 31 at the time. This is the time I have to do this crazy wild thing. If I'm lucky, then when I'm 40, like, I'll see the fruits of that, but it'll have been worth, you know, my 30s. Colonel Sanders started when he was like 60 something. It's never too late, but it's definitely easier the earlier it is right? Because you have less responsibilities. So I was probably pretty lucky that, you know, my risk was pretty low when I left university, didn't get a job. My then girlfriend, my now wife was supporting me, but I didn't have a lot of bills, didn't have a lot of commitments, you know? So I think as you get older and, you know, you're starting to get them, but they're still not all the way there. And, and so the sooner the better, you're more free to fail. And I think as an entrepreneur, you need to fail. You're going to have heaps of failures. That's what, like, that's what it's about. You, you know, you got to keep failing, fail forward, fail fast and keep moving. So the younger you are, the easier it generally is. When you were thinking about how to diversify, did you have a strategy like, I need to have a million dollars in cash before I can start to think about buying a house? Or did you say, I've got 50,000 from the company, I'm going to go buy a house and I'll be broke for six months, who cares? But like, let's just do this. What was that strategy like? You know, you definitely don't need a million dollars. Property is a really good asset for a few reasons. Uh, leverage is a big one of those reasons. Your Series A for the business, that's hard to do. Whereas getting money for a house, it's a very easy thing to do. There's a few boxes you got to tick, but it's like, it's well established. So I think it's a really good way to leverage. And, you know, you can easily take a small amount and you can control a large amount. If you're buying properties that are paying for themselves, well, it's not really costing you anything. And in the US, it's a lot better than Australia. Australia, my properties basically sort of broke even. They were bought in really good areas and they had great capital growth. That's actually a really good investment in Australia. In the US, it's a whole different story. It's why, I mean, I came here on a holiday and I never left the market. Like, it's so easy to have cash flow in properties. It's actually really easy. I think you can use money and leverage. And as you start to get a salary, particularly, now you're like, well, I can use my salary, you know, as this employer hat, and I can now go get loans leverage, buy them well. Uh, and I, I just wanted to acquire, I believe in assets. You know, for me, wealthy isn't a number. Wealth is measured in time. How long can you live without having to work? If you have really big expenses, you might get tens of millions of dollars and it might buy you five years. For me, I like to buy assets that make cash flow because that cash flow pays your expenses. And that's the game. If you can get enough assets that your cash flow is covering your expenses, well, now your time is infinite. You're out of the rat race, you know, and you can build more and more. So for me, the business is a great way to really grow exponentially. You know, you won't get that same exponential growth through property. But if, you, if you're sort of going for the exponential growth, but at the same time, just building that cash flow underneath, it's a pretty safe bet. And then if you make it big in your business, well, then you can really accelerate that cash flow with the cash you generate from your business. Everyone that I've ever talked to says that passive income is their dream. There was like this guy, he's like 23 or 24 in America, where I think he got a loan or one of his family members gave him enough money to like start with a house. And now he's got like a thousand of them after like five years. I make other investments, but if you can just add that safety of some property into it as well. My, my best tip, anyone that's like, you know, if you're a young entrepreneur building a business, buy a duplex or a fourplex with an FHA loan, live in one of the sides, rent out the others. If you do that right, you can generally live rent-free. You basically eliminate your rent. You know, your FHA loan, you need 3.5% down. You have the house. You know, if it's a duplex, you leave one side, you rent out the other. With the way the interest rates are right now, that tenant's probably paying for your house. So now you're living rent-free, you reduce your expenses, that tenant's paying their rent, which is paying down your note. So you're amortizing, you're starting to own equity in that property. And if you're entrepreneurial, you're probably motivated. So you can figure out that after one year, you can get another FHA loan. So you just move out of the duplex, buy the next one, live in that side, rent out the old place, increase your cash flow, and then live free in this one. And and that's actually a really simple formula, which I didn't know when I was younger, I probably would have done that. But I think that's a really simple way to start to like just get on that property ladder while you're hustling, while you're building that business, just have another iron in the fire. So what's an FHA loan? Basically, it's subsidized by the government. So it's a cheap loan. You only need to put down 3.5% of the deposit. So the government backs it because they want people to own properties. It basically means that you need to make a low deposit. You're going to get fixed interest. You can get less than three, but three, three and a half percent fixed for 30 years. I mean, that is solid. Your rent will be more than that. Trust me, that's solid. If you then want to add one layer, if you want me to 
<laughs> get, get a little bit of my theories in there. But like, if you look as well, like the government's printing a massive amounts of money, right? So if you can get a fixed 30 year interest loan, what will happen is I believe in 10, 15 years, you know, you're going to see some amount of inflation. So even if the property doesn't go up, like it'll go up just due to inflation. But if you've got a 30 year fixed note, you're basically paying off your note in today's money and like in 10, 15 years in the future's money. And you're paying off the money in today's money. And that's a really solid bet from my perspective. I think inflation is going to happen a lot faster than that. We see this, the consumer price index is already being affected, although the, the CPI, in fact, is actually not really showing all of the things that people are buying because it's a small basket. I, I think it's like 100 or 200 items. I could be wrong. It could be a little bit more. But economists are lying through their teeth right now saying, oh, we didn't know it was going to be like this. Like, yeah, you knew it was going to be like this when the government's printing trillions of dollars. I think they print what 10% of the entire GDP last year in order to handle the stimulus? Absolutely. And look, I agree. CPI is manipulated. I'm just trying to be conservative. I'm saying, yes, there'll be inflation in 10, 15 years. Like, I think it could be, like, I think it will be faster and more. But I'm just saying, on a conservative case, that works. But definitely, the government is printing this money and they want inflation. They've had trouble generating it because technology is a deflationary thing. There is deflationary forces as well as inflationary forces. But the government wants inflation because it's doing all this debt, right? So how do you make the debt less? You create inflation, which is just like I said, like the government trying to do the same thing as me, right? Like I know what the government's doing. They're racking up this debt. If they get inflation, the debt becomes cheaper. They can actually afford to pay it off. So I'm not going to comment on whether it's a good or bad policy, even though it's bad. But <laughs> what I am going to do is I'm going to position myself for that policy. So I see what they're doing. So I'm just going to do the same thing. I'm lucky I have cash, you know, from, I, we IP had a company. I sold a bunch of my shares and I've been turning cash into property and I buy them really well. So I get discounted properties. But then what I'm doing is I buy it cash so I get that discount. And then what I do is I refinance, I add 30 year debt on it. So I'm positioned that like the debt is well and truly covered by the rent. I'm making a cash flow. A house is an inflation hedge. The debt is a bet because you're going to accelerate that. So bring on inflation. I would love it to come. Let's say someone were to get an FHA loan, but not live in the actual house. Is that acceptable or do you have to live in it? The reason I said FHA is it's an easy way. It's like you said, do I wait till I have a million dollars or do I invest? What I'm saying is with an FHA loan, at, you know, 3.5% deposit, it's obviously, it's not very prohibitive. You don't need that much money to be able to do it, but you do need to live in it. If you don't live in it, you're going to need to come out more like 20% deposit. So it's just going to change that for you. So I just think as a younger person... How do they know you're not living in it? I mean, they look at things like, you know, you got electricity in your name, you got these things in your name. I mean, I guess you could be in Vietnam and not live in it like very often, but as long as that is your principal place of residence. Well, I don't want to live in America. So that's one of the reasons why I've avoided buying property. That makes it easier though, actually, because yeah, you could have it as your residence, but you may maybe only visit occasionally, but it's still your residence. You So you probably couldn't rent out that side. You could rent out the one side and you're really saving that big deposit. And then after one year, you just rent it out. One, after one year, you're, you're safe. So, so you basically would have to keep one side vacant for a year if you want to sort of stay, you know, in the, in the law properly. I, I will let me let me share one mistake I think I made. We IPO'd November last year, and I sold a bunch of shares and I kept a bunch. I got smacked on tax. I just paid my tax bill. It was a very large check. And I, I do want to take some more liquidity out to keep diversifying. I definitely want to. I, I really like our company. Like it's growing. I think it's going to be like you know it's it's valued at three hundred fifteen million. I think it'll be a billion dollar company at some point. So so I want to go for the ride, but I do want some liquidity too to keep diversifying. So my next thought is I'm not going to sell more shares, but I am going to get a margin loan because a loan, it's not a taxable event. You know, instead of selling the shares, I'm just going to get a margin loan on the shares, use the loan as cash to buy the properties, then pull out the money as debt because I'm buying them like distressed and fixing them. I basically pull out all my money as 30 year fix because I'm buying under market value and I pull out the money. So I, I get all my money back, but I have a note for that amount, obviously fixed for 30 years, but I have a tenant too. So going to use the debt, which and, and that's, real, that's a real property trick. And that's why I thought of it because that's how property people do it. They don't sell the properties. They pull out the equity because it's not a taxable event. So I'm going to do that with my shares. So I'm going to take a margin loan. So therefore, I don't lose all that interest. And I want to be in the company too. So I also get the upside of the company. Obviously, it could go down and there's margin calls. So you need to be strategic in how much you take and you don't want to be on the line of getting a big margin call. So, so don't make that decision lightly. But that's how I'm going to handle the next round. I think that's going to be so much better. And I should have done it the first time. What's a margin loan exactly? It's a loan on the shares. I, I like property because it's easy to get loans. With a margin loan, you go to a brokerage, say you got a million dollars worth of shares, they're going to hold those shares as collateral. Like a bank holds a house as collateral. So 
I've got those million dollars worth of shares and they'll have different criteria. Maybe they'll lend you up to 50% of the value. So they might give you 500,000 loan for that million dollars worth of shares and then you'll pay them interest. And that's not taxable. That 500,000 they lend you, it's a loan. You need to pay it back. It's not a taxable event. Now, just we need to be careful, right? If they lend 50% of the value and you take out all 500,000 because it's worth a million, if your share price drops, to 800,000, they're going to do what's called a margin call. They're going to say, you can only have 400,000 now. So you've got to put 100,000 back, you know, and if you don't put that money in, they sell your shares. So they had that shares as collateral. So you need to be careful. So if they'll lend you 50%, don't take 50%, take like 25%, have a threshold. So you're not forced to sell the shares. But yeah, for me, that's just a really tax efficient way to do it. It's a real property strategy. It's why Trump pays no tax because he uses debt, he uses depreciation. As I'm doing more property, I'm like, well, I need to treat my shares like the property guy. Why am I paying tax? The property guys don't pay tax. Like, I'm going to do that. Well, I think he runs his businesses purposely at a loss. Primarily, Donald Trump pays no taxes because he, he buys massive buildings with debt and depreciates them. So, and there's accelerated depreciation. So when he buys a massive building, that building has an asset value and you can depreciate it. You basically say, well, that, that, that building goes down in value every year. And that is a phantom tax claim. You claim that depreciation in the value of the building as a tax deduction. And now there's new laws where you can accelerate that. So you can accelerate all of it. So if you want to keep not paying tax, you've got to keep buying buildings. It's totally legitimate. I laugh at everyone who's like, they get angry that like people like Trump don't pay tax. And it's like, don't get angry. Ask them how. They're not cheating. They're not doing anything wrong. It's incentives. The tax code is incentives that the government puts in place to get people to do what they want them to do. One of those things is they don't want to have to like provide housing for everyone. That's why they provide incentives for people to invest in property. They do that because they want the capital to flow into buildings, apartments, like that's what it's there for. One thing they are talking about changing, and I think I think this government will change it, is a thing called the 1031 exchange. And a 1031 exchange basically means that you can sell a property and you can defer the capital gain. And Trump will do a lot of this. So uh, if I buy a property for 100000 and let's say it's worth a million dollars, and I sell it, obviously my basis is 100000 what I put into it, and $1 million was what I sold it for. So there's a capital gains tax of 900000 Now, with a 1031 exchange, what you do is you exchange into a new property. So you sell that property for a million dollars and you buy another property, it costs you a million dollars. So now the tax basis comes with you. So that 100000 tax basis comes onto this new property, but you don't pay the tax now. You're just deferring it. Eventually, when you sell, if you don't buy a new building, you will need to pay that tax. And that's one thing that Trump does. That's what I'm saying. Like he's depreciating, he's he's deferring the taxes. The only way you don't pay is you keep buying more and more buildings. And that's what the government wants. Like there's a lot of activity underneath that not paying taxes. But the Biden administration has indicated that they're going to stop that. Not legislated yet, but it's probably going to happen. That will cause some problems for people because if they sell, they're not going to be able to do that. So what you're probably going to find is less people selling their properties. That creates money for like a real estate, people. So it sort of, it will hurt the economy to some level. You know, you will find you can sell creatively. We can sell on like as a installment sale and that's a way to defer the taxes. You know, I sometimes buy properties like that. So, so if I have someone who's owned a property for a long time, and when they sell, they're going to get a big capital gains tax and they can't 1031 it, but they don't want to manage that property anymore. I can actually buy it for them on an installment sale. So it spreads the tax out and it means that they're still getting a return. Instead of just losing all that money up front and then getting a return on the money they have, they're basically getting a return for a long period of time. So that's an opportunity for me. I'll, I'll try to buy more properties by installment sale. I didn't realize that all of this was so complicated, but I, I had heard of the 1031 exchange, but I didn't know it by the name. I just knew that that you could defer taxes by buying something bigger over time. It seems like a way to pass assets through generations without an estate tax applied to it. You can't 1031 to your child, but uh, I mean, currently when you die, there's a step up in basis. But that's probably going to change. So, so, so I know a lot of property people freaking out about that, and they're trying to do living trust and plan around that. Because currently, if I died and passed my property on to my kids, when they get it, the basis is the current value, not what I bought it for. So, actually, passing it on was actually a good way to get a new basis. But that is very likely to change as well under this administration. But I mean, to bring it back to like business and investment, so like that's why hard assets, I believe, are valuable. And what you don't want is a pile of cash. So if you are like you want to turn your cash into assets. You want to turn them into something that's doing something for you. And for me, that's the main thing. And that's 
what I've been trying to do and am doing. You know, property is definitely my favorite vehicle. But yeah, I'm, I invest in startups. You know, uh, I still hold shares in my company back home in Australia, and you know, I'm I am looking to diversify continually. Yeah, that's always good. I was looking at gold a few years back and crypto and all that. I haven't really gotten into crypto. I like the idea because I don't like fiat currency. You can probably tell. I do have some gold and silver. But I think crypto is enabling a bunch of, you know, new entrepreneurs because those early adopters are all techie young people, right? And they've built wealth. So they can start companies, they can do things. And I I think that's really good for society. The five investors I have are all crypto guys. (laughs) Yeah, that's case in point. It's beautiful. The world has changed a lot. And I mean, the internet changed that obviously. But back in the day, everything was very capital intensive. It was very hard to start a business you need to have a lot of money a lot of connections you know i think the internet changed out initially and like you know it became much easier to start a business as platforms things you can plug into you don't need the capital and then now with with these um you know cryptocurrencies i think it's just enabled a whole bunch of tech savvy people to make some funds and now they're able to start businesses and and that that's really good just to diversify where the wealth is and to create new entrepreneurs that will create new opportunities and help people grow so is there anything i haven't asked you that you think I should have? <laughs> That's a great question. I think you covered most of the margin loan instead of selling. I sort of asked that for you because I wanted to get that point out there because I definitely am reflecting on that having written a really massive check to the US government. Why did you have to pay the US government? You're not an American citizen. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you don't open a can of worms. Here's the thing. I'm an American resident for tax purposes. You need to pay tax on global income and do need to pay capital gains tax in Australia. But there's a timing issue, right? So we IPO'd in November. So I sold shares in November. And our tax year goes from 1st of July to 30th of June. So that tax comes later in Australia. For America, because it's November, because it's January to December, they're like, this is your tax year. Have you paid tax on that in Australia? Which I haven't. If you haven't paid in Australia, you need to pay in America. So I've had to pay my capital gains tax in America. What's going to happen is I'm then going to have to pay it in Australia. And as soon as I paid in Australia, I can claim a credit and the American government will credit what I paid in Australia. So it's just a timing problem, but it's a pretty painful problem that I have to pay the capital gains tax twice, but I will get it refunded. But it's sort of annoying. How can people follow up with you? My LinkedIn's probably the best. I guess you can link to Stephen Keery um, on LinkedIn. Uh, you can email if you want. I'm steve at homebuyerlouisiana.com. If you like this episode, definitely reach out to Steve on his website or LinkedIn. We'll have the information provided in the show notes. And don't forget that entrepreneurship is a marathon, not a sprint. So take care of yourself every day. And don't forget to take some money off the table when you can to make sure that at the end of the day, you get something for the work you've put into your company. Thank you, Steve. 